to all of you. It is so great to be here, and uh, we've been praying and planning for this for quite some time with the team of leaders here. And I have enjoyed coming to basketball games. I've enjoyed just getting to know Coach O and several of the leadership here who care so much about you and care about you having real conversations. I mean, don't you appreciate that you have leadership here who says, let's not just dust over the tough stuff. Let's actually talk about the issues, the questions that we have. And that's where we're going to go today. I want to talk about three questions that if I, were to, if I were to bet on this, if I were to go around and, and, and every one of you have a conversation, say, what are some questions that deep in your heart you're struggling with and you want to know answers to? I think these are going to be the three questions. But before we get there, I want to share with you something I'm deeply concerned about that keeps us from actually asking some of these difficult questions. And it's the idea that we're distracted. You see, I think we have a distraction epidemic going on in our society. I mean, let me give you a few quick stats. 64% of car accidents are caused by distracted driving. Um, two minutes, this is how long the average student can focus on a given task. Have you ever felt that before, right? Two minutes. Uh, and then you're like, okay, I got to think about something else. So uh, we're distracted even in our work. 50 times, this is how many daily phone checks there are for people between the ages of 25 and 34. 89% of us Check our phones first thing in the morning. How many of that is you? You check your phone, you roll over, it's like right there, and, you, and you're like checking in on messages, whatever. Not only that, but 2.5 hours, that's how much us old people spend on social media. But when you get down to younger people, you'll see in a second, it's a lot more than that. But 650 hours reading emails, right, just, just corresponding with people. Nine hours is the average 8 to 18-year-old. That's how much time is being spent on social media. Typical Internet users, online screen focus, okay? You only get like 40 seconds of focus when you're looking at something online, and, and it's hard to stay focused longer than that. Uh, the challenge with that is we're touching our phones 2,617 times a day. But look at this. It takes 25 minutes after your brain's been distracted to refocus, Okay. So if you get distracted right now looking at your phone, I mean, I just got to say bye to you because I'm not going to get you back for 25 minutes. So this just kind of gives us a quick feel. This is what's happening around us, but this isn't something that came on out of anywhere. We, we know where this came from. It was predictable that we were going to get to this place, that we were going to be a kind of people that would be easily distracted. So for many of you, of course, you've just grown up. This is normal. This is what life's like. This is what you've only known. And sometimes you probably smirk when you hear somebody a little older go, well, man, I just wish you'd put the phone down, or I wish we could be present with one another. I wish we could just talk and have a conversation. You're like, I don't, I don't, I've never really experienced that. I'm not experienced with my parents. I'm not experienced with some of my deepest friendships. I'm not comfortable sometimes in that kind of space. And so we now find ourselves in a little bit of a predicament where we're distracted. Let me, let me read to you just something that's written. It's an author unknown, but listen to this about our distraction. And try to imagine this. He says, Satan called a worldwide convention. In his opening address to his evil angels, he said, we can't keep the Christians from going to church. We can't keep them from reading their Bibles and knowing the truth. We can't even keep them from forming an intimate, abiding relationship experience with Christ. If they gain that connection with Jesus, our power over them is broken. So let them go to their churches. Let them have their conservative lifestyles. But let's steal their time so they can't gain that relationship with Jesus. This is what I want you to do, angels. Distract them from gaining hold of their Savior and maintaining that vital connection throughout their day. Let's even in their recreation, let it be excessive. Have them return from having fun exhausted, disquieted and unprepared for the coming week. Don't let them go out in nature and reflect on God's wonder. Send them to the amusement parks, sporting events, concerts, and movies instead. Keep them busy. And when they meet for spiritual fellowship, involve them in gossip and small talk so that they leave troubled with their consciences and unsettled emotions. Crowd their lives with so many good causes that they have no time to seek power from Christ. Soon they'll be working in their own strength, sacrificing their health and family for the good of the cause. It will work, okay? So this is just an anecdotal idea, but can you see that imaginary conversation? And even can you see it in your own life? I know I can see it in mine. That constantly busy, constantly trying to do things and good things, but are we reserving time for the most intimate relationship in our life? The relationship that's actually going to let you know what's true, help you discern what's false, help you know your purpose in life, help you know and, and gain the satisfaction of feeling fulfilled 
because you know your creator? You see, this is what is at stake for us. This is a quote from uh, one of my favorite books. It's a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. It was written back in 1984. It says, when a population becomes distracted by trivia, when cultural life is redefined as a perpetual round of entertainments, when serious public conversation becomes a form of baby talk, when in short a people become an audience and their public business a vaudeville act, then a nation finds itself at risk. Culture death is a clear possibility. This was written over 30 years ago by a person looking into the future saying, look, we're amusing ourselves to death. And so as I think about us as the church, as Christians, what is it that we're doing to make sure we're not falling prey to that, to that busyness, to that scheme that wants to keep us from seeing the things that are most important? How many of you have ever read 1984 by George Orwell? Okay. It's a book that I enjoyed reading a long time ago. How about Brave New World? Audie was Huxley. Anybody read that? This kind of dystopian uh, literature that was, that was happening. I mean, we're talking 80 years ago, these books were written. One of the things in this book Neil Postman writes is he points out the two different visions from 1984 and Brave New World. So hang with me in this dystopian outlook for the future. I just want to paint for you some of the contrasting visions for where we would be in 2020. Orwell feared those who would actually ban books. But Huxley feared there would be no reason to ban a book, for there would be no one who wanted to read one. Okay, so these are these two different visions of the future. Orwell, in 1984, warns we will be overcome by an externally imposed oppression, kind of an authoritarian uh, government. Huxley believed people will come to love their oppression, to adore the technologies that undo our capacity to think. That's interesting, isn't it? Orwell feared we would become a captive culture, but Huxley feared we would become a trivial culture with an infinite appetite for distraction. Are you seeing some of this play out? Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us, so we would just wouldn't have access to it. Huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. So the truth would be there, but we just wouldn't know how to find it. You see, even from those years, I mean, we're talking some of these books written 70 years ago, almost 85 years ago. There's a prediction for a future that we're now living in, a culture that's distracted, a culture of of a lot of fog. As I talk to people, there's this discussion when we think about our mental health and, and all of the things going through our heads, all the things we must do, all the pressures that we feel. We're sitting in a moment where we're not only distracted, but we're a little confused. And so what I want this morning to be about is let's get back to to understanding some of these basics. I want us to understand how do we actually find truth. You see, the search for truth is not a new thing. It's what every human being seeks. They want to know what's really true. And for many of you, you don't know who to trust anymore. You don't trust your government. You're not sure you can trust your parents. You're not sure you can trust media. You're not sure where to go for truth. And when somebody starts to feel they don't know where to find truth, they can start to despair. This is where the human soul can go. We've seen a significant increase in suicide, not only amongst teenage life and and into our 20s, but 35 to 55-year-olds in American life, the most suicides we've ever seen. In fact, the life expectancy in the U.S. has dropped by two years from 75 years of age for the average adult male to 73 because of how many males are killing themselves in the middle of life. Now, some of this is through suicide. Others has been through opioid addiction. Others, it's been liver disease because of alcohol. But what you can clearly see is that as people start to despair, they find a way to numb out. They find a way to not think about that pain. But as young leaders in this room, you're going to start moving into this world. You're in it. As you graduate, as you take on life, family, career, leadership, people are searching for truth. Will you be somebody who can bring truth to them? Because if we can do that, we are truly being the church. If we can do that, we're going to have answers to questions that people are asking right now that they haven't been asking for decades. Really important questions about why they're here, why they exist. How do they find deep meaning? How How do I find purpose? You see, in the search for truth, Rod Dreher, who's an author, says this, that no society who has abandoned truth and a common way of figuring out the truth can survive. 
He's essentially predicting the collapse of our society. Because he looks forward in this society and says, look, if we don't know how to get to truth, if we're all going to debate your truth, my truth, their truth, everybody's got their own truth, guess what? We can't survive. It doesn't work. And all you have to do is look at the history of civilizations to understand that. It reminds me of 2 Timothy 3, 7, where Paul's writing and he essentially says this, look, we're ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. So we're always learning, right? Are you guys learning a lot? You know, you're listening to podcasts, you're, you're talking with your friends. You know, the average person right now is spending 27 minutes on an Instagram user, 27 minutes a day you're reading Instagram posts, that's how you're getting information, 11 minutes a day any other source for information. So if you're finding your truth from following posts and friends who are just telling you their opinion, and you're spending like a third of that time reading other sources, right? We start to set ourselves up for this predicament. So we have all this information, but do we have knowledge of truth? And that's where I want to go this morning. To do that, I want to read a passage of Scripture that, that I think helps us just get clarity, okay? It's a, it's a little, it can be a little shocking to hear. But the truth is found in God's Word. Our Scriptures is what we know to be true, okay? And you're going to hear this over the next few minutes. You know something you can rely on? You can rely on God's Word to tell you the truth about the world, to tell you the truth about the human condition, to tell you the truth about the human heart and our susceptibility to the enemy and his desire to come in and distract you, distort truth, deceive you, keep you busy so that you don't have time or take the time to understand what's true. So I want us to just let the Word of God kind of flow over us. I want you to just sit in this. I want you to listen. Let the Spirit of God speak to you however he wants to. But I want us to just hear the Word of God this morning in Romans 1, 18 through 32. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Let's pause there for a second. Hear what Paul is writing in Romans is essentially we all have the opportunity to see what's true by just looking at the design of the world around us, by looking at the created order of things, by looking at nature, by seeing the seasons of life, of winter, spring, summer, and fall, of seeing life and death, of just recognizing the beauty of all that he's created, of watching a sunrise and a sunset, that no man was, is without excuse. Like, you can see the truth by just looking at how God's designed all things to function. He continues, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. So check that out. They knew God, right? How many of us say, oh, we believe in God? Or I, I yeah, I think God's real. So, so look, in verse 21, they knew God, but they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. So they claimed to be the smartest people ever, had the most information ever, most knowledge ever, but look, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. How much is that a temptation, right? To just worship created things, you know, worship our technology, worship the things that we can touch and see and not necessarily the creator. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. You see, you start to see here that there's a depravity that sets in. We see this in our culture. We see this in, in people we love, where the mind's no longer thinking clearly. It's starting to do things that actually hurts the body. That isn't how the body's been designed to function. 
We start to treat people in ways that aren't the way God designed us to treat and love people and have compassion for people. We start to take on campaigns that, that lead us to, to fight against uh, what we think is injustice, but realize, wait a second, I'm actually fighting against something that's true. We get confused. Our minds start to get turned over. This is what Paul is talking about. But he goes on to describe, and I conclude with this. They become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. Okay? Invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. This is Romans 1, 18 through 32. This is the basis of the beginning of a book of the Bible that starts to really lay out a lot of truth. A lot of truth as God's designed it for us to understand as his church. And I read this, and it's, it's a bit of a warning to myself. It's meant to be a warning to all of us. Like, it's easy. When you stop glorifying God, when you start understanding who God is, when you stop knowing what the truth is, you are susceptible to your mind getting confused, to you starting to idolize things that were never meant to be idolized, starting to put your hope, starting to put all of, all of your uh, purpose and mission into things that maybe have nothing to do with what God's purposes are. And it can be very confusing. And so in this warning, here's what we understand is that to know God is to know truth, and to know truth is to actually follow after that, to seek after it, to hunger after it, to want to know what's true. You see, in our age of distraction, we're at a moment right now where I think we have a few questions that people want to know answers to, and they don't quite know where to go. Francis Schaeffer said this 50 years ago. He said, we must prepare Christian young people, so you by teaching them what the particular attack in our generation is in contrast to the attacks of previous generations. So the attacks like I dealt with or my parents were dealing with in terms of faith really aren't that relevant to you, are they? You see, you got new questions to answer. Your friends are asking different questions. And, and because of that, we want to prepare you to think well about those. And so what does faithfulness look like? Well, let's look at the three questions that I think are going to be critical for you to be able to wrestle with and to help others find truth in. So the first is, how do I know what is true? How do I know what's true? Isn't this a defining question? Doesn't this keep you up at night? Like, what can I trust? What can I believe? There are three ways that Christians throughout history have known things to be true, okay? The first is understanding God's word, okay? We can go into God's word and we can start to read just like I read to you Romans, and I know that even though it's hard to hear some of the things written in Romans, I think deep in your heart, you know, wow, that's pretty true. That sounds true. It's hard to believe that was written 2,000 years ago because I still see it playing out today because it's played out in every human culture since then. So God's word is our reliable, our reliable foundation for knowing things that are true. If you haven't spent time in God's word because it seems boring or you don't have time because you're busy, I want to encourage you. One of the outcomes from today just might be, look, I'm going to spend time, I'm going to get in and read like a verse tonight. I just want to let God's truth soak over me because God's word is living and active. This isn't a history book. This isn't one of your textbooks. It's not meant to be something that you just go back and, and sort of just peruse so that you can understand stories. No, this is living and active. And even as I read it over you, I know the Spirit of God moves and starts to stir your hearts because it's living and active. But it's also a sword. It rightly divides truth. Okay? So, so it can hurt sometimes. You can read the Word of God and it, it can start to, to give you anxiety because you're like, wow, I, I didn't think about this before. And the Holy Spirit's trying to cultivate and work in your heart. So let that happen, but it only happens if we take time to put it in it. The, the second thing we write about in Romans is nature, is, is the created order. It's God's design. We can see it simply all around us. And so that's one way throughout history people have known things to be true. Is does it follow just the order of God's design of how human beings were meant to function and flourish, of how societies were meant to function and flourish? And so we can ask that question. The third is we look back, and, and church history helps us understand truth because you can you can see over 2,000 years, how has the church handled all these incredible issues and situations? And, and when we go back and look at our history, we can start to learn from the wisdom of church fathers. Um, but we also rely on the Holy Spirit to reveal things to us. And it's through that, that through the Holy Spirit revealing to us things that are true, we actually go back to God's word and make sure it aligns with what his word says. It never contradicts his word. 
But once, once the Holy Spirit reveals something to us, using God's word as the foundation, that's another way we can know things are true. But let me tell you how you're being told to know things are true. You and I both have grown up in an age where we're being told things are true only if you can see, feel, and touch them, right? It's called materialism. It's the idea that, that you can only know something if you can see it, and if you can't see it, so when we talk about the spiritual world, right? Well, that can't be true because I can't see it. I can't touch it. Or maybe rationalism, the idea that, that logic and, and only through logic can you know something is true. Or maybe it's romanticism, right? It's your feeling. It's that, it's that if it feels true, then it could be true. Now, guess what? That's one of the great lies you're being told today, that you can know truth by what you feel. That actually your feelings are the dominant way of knowing something's true and that you should trust your heart, whereas in Scripture we're told, don't trust your heart. A foolish man trusts in his heart. You see, we don't know truth by what we feel. All these things can be used in their senses that God's given us. Materialism, like the things we see, nature around us, that's part of understanding truth. Using logic is part of understanding truth. But in our culture today, the culture's telling you, you have to pick one of those, and that's how you can know what's true. And you know what the beauty of the Christian story is? Is that there's a sliver in, of truth in every one of those ideas. But the Christian faith pulls it all together. So it's not that materialism's 100% wrong. It's just like 75% wrong, okay? It's not that romanticism's 100% wrong. It's just like it, there's a part of it that's true, but there's a lot of it that's not true. And so as Christians, we get to actually take the best of all of that and go, you know what? I can appreciate material things. I can appreciate my feelings as part of what God's given me to discern and to understand but where I'm going to put my reliability is on God's word. This is how we know what is true. And if we start there, if we can understand how to know truth, we start to gain confidence because we start to realize that when I understand this truth, I'm going to live my life with such a purpose that it's going to align with how God's designed me to function and to live. Um, this, this quote from Nancy Piercy, I think, sums it up well. She says, we should be making the case that whatever is genuinely good and true finds its true home within Christianity. Every ism, so materialism, rationalism, romanticism, okay? Every ism isolates on a strand from the rich fabric of truth. But Christianity alone provides what the greatest philosophers and sages have sought all along, a coherent and transcendent framework that encompasses all of human knowledge. Now you're being told things are true through the entertainment you're listening to, the music you're listening to, the, the binge watching that you might do on Netflix, right? Everybody's competing for the truth narrative. And so I want this morning to just be a reminder to you that those are all sources. People are wanting you to believe their story. The only way you can survive the onslaught of that information is to actually have God's word going deep into your heart so you can start to discern and rightly divide what is true. The second question, it's a huge question for us. Where do I find meaning? Where do I find meaning? We need this as human beings. This is one of those ancient questions. It's always been asked. Where do I find meaning? And, and today, there's a lot of competition for how to find meaning, and a lot of people trying to tell you how you're going to find meaning. I would submit to you part of our mental health crisis at the moment is because we're seeking meaning in a lot of things that actually don't fulfill our deepest desire for, for being known and for finding purpose and meaning. Just look at this data uh, that we did in one of our research projects with uh, the average American that said to be fulfilled in life, you should pursue the things you desire most. 86% of Americans, that's what they believe is going to lead to meaning, is just pursue the things you desire most, okay? But you see, this is the distraction. The distraction is saying to us, pleasure, money, and accumulation is how you experience meaning in this world. And you're going to see that in advertisements. You're going to see it in most of the stories that are being told to you. That if you really want to feel meaning, go get that great job, go make a lot of money, go buy that big house, go enjoy you know, great trips and vacations, and this will ultimately give you fulfillment. But it's false. 84% of Americans say the highest goal in life is just to enjoy it as much as possible. Right? YOLO. Like, just do whatever. This is it. Enjoy it as much as you possibly can. That will bring you meaning. It's a very unrooted way to think about eternity. You see, as a Christian, you understand there's eternity. You understand that we're here for a short period of time. 
relatively speaking, a, a, just a sliver of time. It's hard to think about that, but it's just true. But we're going to have an eternity in front of us where the things that we do here are going to count. It's going to matter. It's not only about you only live once, do whatever you want. Fulfill your pleasures and desires however you want. That's a lie from the enemy to distract you, to get you off course. You see, what Christ wants is for you to recognize that, look, you do only live once, and so I want you to take account of every day, every hour, every minute. How are you investing it? How are you staying above the enemy's uh, desire to distract and keep you busy? And so we want to think well about that. You see, the truth is you find meaning through serving and sacrifice. You see, this is the Christian story throughout history that you don't find meaning by just going and puffing yourself up and enjoying life. You actually find the deepest meaning when you serve others. When you actually have to sacrifice maybe something you desired for the sake or the benefit of those around you, for your neighbors. You find the deepest meaning. You know, in, in our own life, Rebecca and I, my wife, we have three children. Our oldest is, uh, is named Kate. He's 19 he was born with Down syndrome. I was 26 years old. It was a surprise to us. How many of you have a family member or friend who has Down syndrome? Anybody in here? Okay. So these little kids are just amazing, full of joy, lots of fun, lots of laughter. And it, but it was, a, it was a total reset of our life. I was 26 years old, firstborn son. I was a quarterback in high school, basketball athlete, loved all that. And I thought my firstborn son, he'd just follow right in my footsteps. Well, when he's born with this disability, it meant he probably wasn't going to really do all of that. And so with Down syndrome, they're more delayed. There's a physical delay. There could be a mental delay. They can typically do anything anybody else is. It just takes a little longer. Well, fast forward 19, 18 years. I've had a great life with Kate. He's amazing. Such a joy to have in our family. God taught me a lot through resetting and realizing life isn't about you just pursuing making money and having a great career. In fact, when Cade was born, it's what God used to send me on this path to start Q and to start the work that I do today to try to help more and more Christians be thoughtful about the world, understand what their purpose and meaning is in life. So God used that to help me be reminded that this isn't about you. So fast forward 18 years, and we have two other children, 17-year-old son, 14-year-old daughter, Pierce and Kennedy. And God just kind of put on our heart that we should adopt a little child, and we should adopt a little girl with Down syndrome. And then through a series of events and a friend that sends us this little picture of a five-year-old girl in China with Down syndrome, uh, you know, this was about a year ago, uh, or two years ago, Rebecca and I said, you know what, this makes zero sense. Our children are almost out of the house. We have all these, these visions of like a future that could be uh, traveling more together and, and all of that, that that people tend to do, right, the American dream. But we realize, wait, God's inviting us into something. He's inviting us into something way better than whatever we're thinking we're going to go do. We need to obey. We need to just walk into this. And so what we did was walk into that. And so we adopted Joy about a year ago, brought her back from China. She's six years old. She's such a delight. And I would say this last year has been one of the most meaningful for our family. It's brought us closer. Our purpose is more defined and clear. It has required sacrifice. It's required changing things that we used to do. And we now have a child in kindergarten and three high schoolers, right? So it just changed life. But the meaning and purpose that we found through like a different way of thinking about life has been profound, so profound. And so what I want to encourage you to do is think about meaning differently. Let's not think about it as what can I accumulate because that's the distraction. But let's think about it as where is God calling me to serve? Where might he be calling me to sacrifice? final question and i think one of the most important for your generation and for all of us but i think it's a question being asked right now a lot in the younger generation how can i be known right how can i be known and the world's competing with this question with a lot of answers to it a lot of really interesting answers you see the world wants you to know that you can be known by identifying with a unique group right labeling yourself this is the predominant way that I see him stirring up distraction is to tell a young person that the only way you could truly be known is not just to be true to who you are or to give yourself some time to grow up, but to actually start identifying yourself with different groups. 
And by identifying with a certain group, you can be known. You can have a, a little tribe. You can have a little community that's all thinking the same way, and, and you feel known. And you know why we naturally do that as humans and want that? It's because our hearts are drawn towards acceptance. This is just the human heart. Like, you just go to where you're accepted. So if you kind of felt rejected by your parents, right, or think about your high school life, the friends you hung out with, you hung out with the people who accepted you, who just said, I like you for who you are. You don't have to put on anything for me. You don't have to act a certain way. Like, I just accept you. And, and your heart is just drawn towards it. And so it's, again, a natural human tendency to want that, to want that kind of community. The way the enemy distorts that is he says, now, once you've found your group of friends, that is your identity. Or a cause is your identity. Or I'm going to be a climate change activist, right? Or I'm going to promote this ca campaign. I'm going to be a Bernie Sanders guy. Or I'm going to be a Trump guy. Right? It's like all these little groups start to identify, and you start to find this identity in it. It starts to make you feel like you've got purpose, but you're putting all of your hope in the wrong thing. Now, at Q, with our event, I know we've done Q Union here. I know there's some people in here who've actually spoken for that gathering we do in October. Thank you guys for being a part of that. We try to ask tough questions and talk about the difficult issues. And so even today, I'm not shying away from some of those because I think it's important that there's space where we talk about it, but one of the stories that was so compelling at our Q event this last year was, was hearing from three different people who've had the temptation to identify with a certain group and decided, you know what, that's not where I'm going to find my deepest meaning, and so I just want you to benefit for a second from what their stories were. Now, it's around this topic of, of sexuality, right, a tough one to talk about, one that can be very toxic to talk about. My goal here is this is not toxic. This is about how do we hear three different stories that you're not hearing a lot? I want you to be exposed to three different people and their stories. The first, if you see the guy on the left, uh, Preston, who's interviewing this group, the first guy, Matthew, is a, is a student at Juilliard, composer, identifies as a gay man who's chosen to live his life as a celibate gay man. He said, you know what? Because of the lordship of Christ in my life, like, I can live without sex, but I can't live without this deep commitment to my relationship with Jesus. And so I'm actually going to I'm actually going to submit these feelings that are very real for me. I'm going to submit them into the lordship of Christ and I'm going to do my best to live faithfully in this way. That's a hard decision. That is not a normal decision. That is not what the world would tell anybody to do. But what he said is I'm not going to identify as just this person or with this group. I'm actually going to identify as a child of God and I'm going to live into this purpose even if it's hard, even if it's difficult, even if it's it's complicated amongst my relationships. That's what I'm going to do. The middle person, Lori, another college story, grew up in the church, started to experiment with, with uh, being a lesbian in college, had a relationship. All of a sudden, through that period of time, starts to realize that, that maybe this isn't what God has for me. Maybe I'm not supposed to become a lesbian or I'm not supposed to just pursue that attraction, which is so real for her. And instead what she does is she meets a guy, a guy named Matt. It's the only man in her life she's attracted to, okay? She's not attracted to men, but she was attracted to Matt. And so she meets Matt and says, you know what? I think this is God's design. As I look at God's design of all things, I think he wants this. And so she actually pursues getting married. And now it, even in this uh, conversation, she's pregnant with their child. And she's been married for many, many years. And now she helps many other people going through these critical years of experimentation, of trying to find identity, of being told that your identity is in your feelings and pursuing your sexual attraction. She's saying, no, there's a hole in every one of our hearts that's trying to be filled. And it might be that for you. It might be money for somebody else. It might be buying shoes for somebody else. It might be trying to pursue a career. It, it can be anything. It's not just about sexuality. It's about we're all trying to fill this, this vacuum in our heart with something. And she's saying, no, there's more. There's more. The final is Kat. Kat's in her 20s now, experiences gender dysphoria. I have friends who experience gender dysphoria, and I know there's probably people in this room going through that too, and, and the feeling of that has to just be so difficult. To be in a body that you don't feel like was meant to be your body, or, or to, that doesn't align with how you see things. And so Kat went through this journey of going to a counselor. The counselor saying, you know what? I think the way you're going to get there is we need to get you on medication. I'm going to help you transition as quickly as possible because that's how you're going to feel fulfilled. Kat left that office that day not feeling known, not feeling understood, 
She wasn't necessarily knowing that's what she wanted to do, but it felt pressured. She meets a friend at church. She goes, shows up at church. A friend welcomes her in and says, you know what? Just go on this journey with me. You don't have to change who you are. You don't have to do anything. Just go on this journey and, and to see what Christ has for you. And over the course of time and growing in her faith said, you know what? I still have these feelings, but you know what? I'm going to live as a, as a woman. I'm going to pursue this. I want to pursue what God's designed for me. You see, this is difficult to talk about, isn't it? It's hard in a big group like this because I know I'm talking, you have friends, family members, you're sitting here. Some of you are experiencing this. This isn't meant to talk about this, to, to judge anything that you're feeling in any way. It's just to say, look, I want you to understand there are stories of people who are living this out, who God's called and said, look, I want you to submit your feelings into the Lordship of Christ. I want you to trust me that you're going to find the deepest meaning. You're going to actually be more known, not by pursuing what the world's necessarily saying you should do to be known, but by following what my scriptures say, by following what I who designed you knows is going to bring you the deepest meaning. We had another couple that came and, and I asked them to share. It's a couple that's married with Down syndrome. Okay, how cute is this? They've been married for a decade. And I wanted them to give a, a great talk on love and marriage. And so they did. They shared in nine minutes like their secret to success. You know what they said to this audience of really smart people? They said, a lot of you are smart, but you know what? Being smart doesn't make you happy. What makes you happy is being known, being loved, being cared for. And that's what the two of them have together. You see, Nancy Piercy says it like this, that what we long for most of all is to be known and loved for who we are as unique persons. A longing that can be met only if the divine is a person. The goal is not to suppress our desires. Okay, hear me. The goal is not to suppress our desires, but to direct them to what truly satisfies, to a passionate love relationship with the ultimate transcendent person. So as I close today, and Eli, if you want to come up, as I, as I close out this morning, here's what I want to ask you. Is do you feel known? Are you experiencing meaning in your life? Do you know where you can find truth? You see, these three questions, are, I think, are at the center of what it is that we're feeling as a population. We're feeling it as a generation. I think the questions towards these, uh, these ends right now are going to come on quicker. I think your friends are going to ask this a lot more in the year ahead. I think they're going to be looking for leaders like you who say, you know what, I can help you with that. I don't have it all figured out. I don't know every answer to everything, but let me help you understand that there's one thing you can rely on to know what is true, and that's God's word, that's scripture. And if you've never picked up a Bible, if you've never read scripture, like let me just show you a few verses. Let me start in Proverbs and let you just see wisdom. Let me take you to Psalms and see somebody who's going through a mental health crisis of his own, David, and how he's reaching out to Christ and how in that he could actually find peace and purpose. Let me take you into the New Testament and just see how the future has been predicted, how we can see that throughout life the enemy's going to constantly try to distort the truth to keep you off base because you know what the enemy wants more than anything? He wants death. That's what he wants. He wants to steal your life he wants to take your life. He doesn't want you to live in a meaningful, fulfilled existence. He wants you to live distracted and busy until it's too late. Now, there's some of you that might be hearing all this, and I know you hear this, this kind of talk a lot, right? You hear about Jesus a lot, and maybe you've just tuned it out. Maybe today, though, the Spirit of God has just awakened something in you. And the Spirit of God is saying to you, look, I don't know, you, you know God, you talk about God, but are you glorifying God? Are you giving thanks to Him? You really know him through Jesus. And I want to just have a moment where you have that opportunity right now to consider, do you know God? Have you invited the God of the universe through his son, Jesus Christ, who actually came to give you this life through the cross, give you this new life? Have you actually invited him in? Has there been a moment where you've said, God, take over? I'm hearing Gabe talk about a bunch of this stuff, about truth, about meaning and purpose. I don't know where I land on all of it. I know I don't feel, I don't feel confident that I know you. And I just want to take a moment this morning to pray for you. And I want to invite you to pray along with me if that's you as I close in prayer. That you would make this a moment that you mark your life with and say, I'm going to pursue this. I'm going to pursue truth. I'm going to pursue true meaning and purpose. I'm going to do that in community with my friends. We're going to dig in. We're going to learn more about what God has to say about all of that. And I just want to invite you to, if God's speaking to you right now, the Holy Spirit's doing that, just right there in your chair, I want you to say a prayer with me. 
as I pray over all of us. Father, we're just so grateful for a group of students like this who are coming together to seek truth. God, I know they're busy. I know they've got classes. I know it's just another chapel. But God, may this day, will your spirit just cultivate and work in their hearts, God? Will you convict? Will your spirit convict and arrest our hearts to ensure that we know you, God? God, for the students in here this morning who are saying, I'm not sure I've ever really submitted to the Lordship of Christ. I want to invite them to pray along with me and say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know that this sin has distorted my view of all things. I don't even know where to begin with how it's distorted it. But I know I need you to help me understand the truth. I need to accept your forgiveness for my sin. And accept your Holy Spirit to flow through me, to enlighten me to your truth, to your ways, to give me that hunger to get into your word, to better understand truth and to know my purpose and my meaning. So God, I just ask that you will receive these prayers, that you will do a transformative work in the hearts of the students this morning who are praying that prayer right now in their seat. God, give them the confidence to share it with a friend, with maybe a professor, with a coach. God, that they want to walk out that journey more, God, and we just praise you for that. God, give everybody else here who's committed to you the clarity and confidence to walk forward in this truth, God, for this year ahead, that you'll just give them the strength to know how to answer these questions better than the world is trying to answer them for themselves and for their friends. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us for Chapel today. Be sure to check back every Tuesday and Thursday for our next gathering.